Thank you, Professor Bias, for that kind introduction. I wish my mother were here to hear that. <laughs> Let's start with a movie. Uh, the cast of characters in the movie is a little complicated, so let me uh, point them out to you. Over here on this side of the, uh, of the uh, screen will be the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The units of that are parts per million, so not much. On this axis is where you are on the world, North Pole, South Pole, Equator. This red dot is an important place on this map. It's the island of Hawaii, where a series of extremely important measurements were made from 1956 until the present day. Over here is the same concentrations, but here is plotted as a function of time. Uh, and we're going to go back in time about a million years by the time our movie is done. Uh, and then this clock so, sort of tells you where we are in time. So that's uh, the cast of characters. Now let's watch the movie, shall we? So uh, first of all, you see that uh, the concentration jumps up and down. The red line tells you that on the island of Hawaii, uh, this is going up and down about every year. Uh, the blue line is at the South Pole, and it's also going up and down, although not as steep. And its downs are where the uh, Hawaii is up and vice versa. See, lots of measuring stations are coming online as we go along. And you see some of them are quite noisy. Uh, let's uh, just keep following on. Here's the trend line is continuing. And I think it's obvious to all of you, isn't it, that the concentration average over the whole world is going up as a function of time. Uh, and this is going to keep going, I believe, until 2016, where at that time it was 403 parts per million, and today it is at 413 parts per million. Uh, we're going to jump very shortly to a different set of measurements, measurements which come from uh, ice cores that were taken in the Antarctic. I'll say more about that later. Here's more Hawaii data going back to about 1956 or so. And uh, boom, now we should jump to the ice core data. Here we are back uh, going to the year zero. And then we're going to jump to a different set of ice cores and start looking way back in time. So you see the concentration of CO2 is jumping around quite a bit, uh, 50,000 years ago, and so forth and so on. So one thing I want you to notice is that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere varies a lot in the past million years. A lot of ups and downs. Where we are today is way up here. And uh, just in case you think this is a conspiracy by the Americans or the Iranians or whoever it is, let's just take a look at some of the research groups that have contributed to this data, various places throughout the world, some of which are friendly to you wherever you are, and some of which are not wherever you are. Uh, and so it's been a worldwide effort to collect uh, these, uh, these kind of data. So um, why is that happening? Where's that CO2 coming from? Uh, and this man, Dave Keeling, was uh, uh, the originator of the so-called Keeling Curve. He began the measurements on a mountaintop in Hawaii, uh, where the atmosphere disturbances from weather were minimized. And he began collecting these data. And these data are called the Keeling Curve, after Dave Keeling. Uh, and they also made a national historic landmark for the Chem American Chemical Society. So again, I ask, why is it rising? So his son uh, decided to take up this question. And here's uh, an interesting formula. Those of you who know simple chemistry uh, will recognize that if you burn a fuel, you consume oxygen. And so this uh, stoichiometry tells us that if uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is coming from increased combustion, that is, we're burning our fuels, then the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere must be decreasing. That's what chemistry stoichiometry says. Uh, and it was uh, Dave's son, Ralph, who took up this charge and began a series of measurements in the mid-1990s, continuing to this day, in which he looks at the amount of uh, oxygen in the atmosphere is decreasing. It fluctuates just in the same way as the CO2 does, but the rate of decrease and the rate of increase match each other for this stoichiometry, provided you calculate how much CO2 is absorbed in water. So the answer is that the CO2 is coming from combustion. Now, there is a much more sophisticated way to make the connection between CO2 in the air and combustion, and it has to do with measuring the isotopes of carbon. That's a technical detail that might not be important to all of us. I find this to be the most compelling story. The answer is we're burning fuel because the oxygen is being consumed. 
So let's uh, take an example. Let's take a trip to Germany. We'll go to near the Polish border. There's a power station there, the Jenschwalder power station. It is one of the most sophisticated in Germany. It is an engineering marvel. Uh, here it is shown here on these images. Uh, it's one of the most efficient coal-fired power plants in the world. It produces about three gigawatts of power. And just as a reminder that uh, Germany uh, uses, a, about one quarter of Germany's power comes from burning coal. So it's a lot of coal, so let's figure out how much CO2 comes from just this one coal-fired power plant. So that's an easy enough calculation to do. This is something that an introductory student at NYU Abu Dhabi might be able to do. That's how much power is produced. That's how much power uh, is consumed per kilogram of coal. It's 35% efficient. Uh, you figure out a few factors and you get 25,000 tons per day of coal is consumed by the Enchwald power plant. So that's a big number to try and get a handle of. So that's about 218 railroad cars full of coal per day at one coal-fired power plant uh, in Germany. So uh, the, now you're going to ask, well, how much CO2 comes from 25,000 uh, tons of coal? Well, again, we can do some chemistry calculations. The details aren't very important. The stoichiometry tells us how much CO2 is produced. Uh, there's some uh, conversion factors. And we wind up with 3,292 cubic meters per second of flue gas coming from uh, this power plant. 3,000 cubic meters per second is uh, also a difficult number to get our head around. So what would be uh, an object that we could use to imagine this much hot, warm gas? Well, the answer is we would go to the Trump Tower in New York City, look at the architectural diagrams, and recognize that about 300,000 cubic meters uh, are the interior volume, which means this coal-fired power plant would fill up the Trump Tower about every 92 seconds, and 12% of that flue gas is CO2. One coal-fired power plant in one part of Germany. Uh, let's take a look at more coal-fired power plants. Let's take the world and we'll go to 2017 and we recognize that 1,400 million tons of CO2 were produced just from coal-fired power plants in that particular year. Big number. How do I imagine that? Well, you go to the plastics industry and in that same year we produced, the world produced, 344 million tons of plastics. So coal-fired power plants alone in one year produce by weight four times as much CO2 as all the plastics produced in the world. So the atmosphere is changing. Uh, it's changing because it's, it's due to us. And uh, the atmosphere then has become the receptacle for our carbon waste. So how does the Earth cope with this much CO2? If it's changing that rapidly, as it has changed historically, what are the mechanisms by which CO2 is dealt with? To do that, we have to use a, a tool in science called a variance spectrum. And I'm sorry, it's a little wonky for some of you, but let me just try to give you an example. Imagine your body as an object, and you're going to keep track of the mass of your body. And on this scale is the time scale of something you do to your body. And on this scale uh, is the change in your body weight. So for example, you eat three times a day. That's a one third of a day is the rate at which that happens. And you have a certain increase, a certain change in mass. And other things happen to your body, say on the order of once a day, and your body also changes mass. And maybe uh, you're uh, better than I am and you go to the gym every other day and because of sweat and respiration and so forth, you might change your body mass. So there's three peaks in this variance spectrum at a third of a day, a day, and two days. So let's look at the variance spectrum for CO2 in the atmosphere and ask what's going on there. So here it is here, the change in the CO2 concentration in the air, as, and this is the uh, time scale here, and this is both log-log scales. So something happens every day, something happens on the order of a year, something happens over many tens of thousands of years, and something very big is happening on the 10 million year time scale. The events associated with these peaks in the variance spectrum are the events that control CO2 in the atmosphere. So let's take them apart one at a time. On a day, that's a pretty easy thing to imagine. Photosynthesis happens in the day. That is, plants that give off CO2, uh, and they take up CO2 during the day and night during the photosynthesis cycle. 
Uh, on the order of a year, this is the annual cycle, and these were the bumps and wiggles that we saw in the Ke Keeling curve. Now, those of you that are sharp will say, well, how can there be bumps and wiggles in the northern hemisphere uh, when there should be equal bumps and wiggles in the southern and they should all cancel out? Two reasons. There's a lot more plant matter in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. Second reason is the hemispheres don't mix very well. So that's why we see two separate peaks. So these peaks are associated also with uh, photosynthetic activity. So here you see some of the data from Hawaii. Uh, this is one particular year. Uh, and you can see in the summertime the amount of CO2 drops. Uh, it's because the plants are growing and the plants are dying in the winter and they come back up. And the difference here to the end of the year here is about 3 ppm. And that's you and I using the atmosphere as a waste dump. These peaks are a lot more complicated. There's a lot of things happening here, uh, and those are associated with those bumps and wiggles we saw earlier. So how do we uh, understand what those are due to? One of the greatest tools that has happened in the last 50 years is that scientists will go to places like Greenland, the Arctic, and the Antarctic, and they drill down and they pull up uh, an ice core that you can see in this picture here taken at a station in Antarctica. So what does the ice core tell you? So as snow falls any given year onto the Arctic, uh, it captures the air around it and entrains it in those snowflakes. And then the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and the next year. So when you pull up this ice core, what you're doing is going back in time and you use uh, chemical analytical methods to get the composition of the air that was trapped inside of that ice core as a function of time. Uh, and uh, that gives you these data here. So here we have an 800,000 year time span, and you see these fluctuations of CO2 in the atmosphere that's associated with these peaks. Some of them are due to the sun, some of them are due to other aspects that you may have heard about. Uh, the biggest peaks have to do with the ice ages coming and going, uh, shown here in my favorite woolly mammoths. And so what is, the, what is the mechanism by which these ice ages come and go? Uh, that is, what is this large peak in this particular uh, variant spectrum? That's not really clear. It's one of the great challenges in uh, geological sciences. But it is largely believed, and uh, data is being uh, collected to examine this hypothesis, that a large bolus of CO2 is carried uh, in the oceans underwater. The bolus reappears every 10,000 years or so. Plants grow, and they take up CO2 from the atmosphere, and then they sink to the bottom of the ocean, and then are carried and then brought back up again, so-called biological pump. And so this is the time scale for underwater circulation is on the order of 10 to 100,000 years. So that's believed to be one of the mechanisms associated with those peaks. Now we have this very large peak uh, that takes a very long time scale. These are geological time scales. So what is the uh, processes associated with that? Well, we start by taking CO2 in the atmosphere and reacting it with rain, rainwater to produce a carbamic acid. The carbamic acid dissolves the rocks uh, on the surface and deposits into the ocean bicarbonate uh, at calcium and silicon islands, uh, uh, ions. And they can be taken up by plant life in the form of, for example, shells and carried to the bottom of the ocean. So you have this process that looks something like this. You have CO2 in the atmosphere, weathering the rocks, carrying species into the oceans. Some of it is deposited by shells. And when you reach a tectonic plate, some of that material is subducted underground, deep underground. It gets so deep, it gets hot and melts. Uh, that melting process releases the CO2, uh, and uh, that CO2 comes in back into the air as volcanism. So you have this cycle occurring, this natural geological cycle of CO2 moving from the air to the ground or, and waters, and then uh, to the uh, subsurface. Now, the interesting thing about this geological time scale is let's ask, what's the amount of CO2 in each one of these reservoirs? And I'm going to use just an arbitrary scale. Let's say the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is 1. Then the amount of CO2 in the waters is 48. And look what uh, uh, in the planet Earth, over 5 million. In other words, what's going on in the atmosphere is a one part in 5 million effect to what's going on uh, subsurface. So here's the good news for all of you. No matter what happens up here, uh, over this time scale, it'll all re-equilibrate back to 5 million. So in 100,000 or a million years, 
No problem. In fact, we'll show uh, some data for that in just a few slides. So here we have our uh, variance spectrum. <clears throat> Here's the, uh, this peak right around here. And you might ask, well, let's, let's uh, ask how big is the human contribution to this variance spectrum? That is, what have you and I done in the past 100 years? Uh, and the answer is, it looks like a peak just like this on the time scale of 100 years. And that's the human contribution to combust from combustion in the variance spectrum. It's as large or larger than uh, the natural processes, except for, of course, this big one. So we are changing the atmosphere. The Earth responds over a many time scales. And uh, there are some consequences. So let's start looking at what the consequences for uh, using the atmosphere is our carbon waste dump. And the most obvious one, and the one you're probably most connected to, is temperature. So let's look at the consequences for temperature for a minute. And how are we to understand that? In talking with some of my NYU Abu Dhabi colleagues today, it was challenged that I even describe this to you because it's kind of wonky and technical. But it's something I feel it's very important for you to grasp because you hear the word greenhouse gases, and it's a really bad word to use. Uh, because what is happening is actually not uh, a greenhouse effect at all. So let's take a look at a minute at what happens when sunshine, uh, which comes from the sun, which is at about 3,000 degrees centigrade, and lands on the Earth, uh, which is at about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and lands on the Earth, which is about 300 Kelvin. So uh, there's flux, as energy emitted from the sun in the form of a flux, uh, and that flux has units of energy per area per time. That is, sunshine impinges upon the Earth at a certain rate. The Earth is a body in the space, and it radiates Earth shine at a certain flux that's also proportional to its temperature. And the interesting thing about physics, one of the great interesting things, is that energy is conserved, which is to say this system has to be at equilibrium, which means these two fluxes have to be equal to each other. So if the, uh, if the temperature of the sun rises, then the flux from the sun rises, and the earth shine has to rise to match that. And so the earth's temperature has to go up. So it's obvious to you all, if the sun gets hotter, the earth gets hotter. If the sun gets cooler, the earth gets cooler. That's the easy part about understanding equilibrium. The hard part is to figure out what's actually happening on the planet Earth. So here's our incoming sunlight in units of 340 watts per square meter. And about a third of it is reflected right away. Uh, and that means the difference of these two numbers has to be equal to this number for the Earth to be at equilibrium. And that's what is shown in this slide. But what happens underneath though, that is very, very complicated. A lot of things are going on. Physics which we understand, physics which we uh, don't fully understand. For example, cloud formation and how they affect all these various things. But more or less, this is the picture we have. So here's sunshine, here's earthshine. Ah, but that earthshine is intercepted by gases which absorb that particular radiation and re-radiate it back down to the Earth. And so the difference between these two numbers is this one. And then we're in perfect balance. So what happens then if we jump up the greenhouse gases? We divert more of this 400 arrow into this one. Uh, and what that means is that we're no longer at 240 coming out. And the Earth responds to change that. And that's the so-called radiative forcing. This is the difference between these two numbers. And it basically says when we put more greenhouse gases into the air, that means the temperature of the Earth changes so that this number comes back to 240. So 400 minus more means the temperature has to go up to get that to 240. That's the uh, units or the quantity that climate scientists talk about uh, the planet, which is the radiative forcing. It could be negative or positive, depending on whether these numbers change positively or negatively. So this is all hypothesis, right? But we don't really know this, right? And believe it or not, until 2015, this wasn't measured. But now it has been measured. So what do you do? You get on a satellite, and you measure the incoming light, the reflected light, and the outgoing light. Those are basically sophisticated infrared cameras. And you go down to the Earth, and you measure how much sunlight hits the Earth, and how much Earth shine is reflected back to the Earth. And you measure those, also sophisticated infrared cameras. And then while you're at it, you measure changes in the greenhouse gases, which you can do with analytical methods. 
and then uh, you calculate the radiative forcing in watts per meter squared, and you do it for a decade. And the result, which was just published in 2015, one of my colleagues at Berkeley, Bill Collins, was one of the authors. Here's the radiative forcing. Here's the change in CO2 in the atmosphere. And you see they match each other perfectly, uh, and both in the trend line and the fluctuations. So our CO2 waste is warming the planet by radiative forcing. Um, called the greenhouse effect, but a bad word because it, greenhouses operate on a different principle. It operates because CO2 absorbs some Earth's shine, reflects that energy back to the planet, and the planet warms to get the net Earth shine back to, the, uh, to space uh, on the same values. So uh, there are so many ways to show the temperature of the planet. I like this movie a lot because it shows both geography and averages. Uh, blue is cooler than the average for the last 100 years. Red is higher than the average for the last 100 years. By the way, here's the United Arab Emirates here, so here we are around the planet. And I think this uh, graph speaks for itself. So the last four of the last five years have been the highest temperatures recorded in uh, human history, just to give you an example. Uh, here's another way. Uh, this was published recently, another way to show the same kinds of data. Blue is cooler than the last 100-year average. Red is warmer than the last 100-year average. Uh, and this is time getting, going from 1901 to 2018. Here's all of the Earth. Here's the United Arab Emirates over here. I think that's pretty obvious to all of you. By the way, many of you may have heard about this. Uh, let's limit the temperature rise of the planet to 2 degrees C. On average, we're only at about one and a half degrees C so far. But if you look at this map of the United States and recognize that this over 100 year average, there are regions of the United States which have already well exceeded the two degree, uh, degree change. So on average, we may not be warming as much as we expect. But of course, locally, those effects can be different. And uh, we're seeing those already. So. Weather is another consequence. Temperature and weather are not unrelated. So um, you know, climate is what happens on the average. Weather is what you feel today. So what is the relationship between changing CO2 in the atmosphere and weather? And that answer is also very difficult. Uh, but some of our colleagues published a paper. It's getting a little old now. But it's one of the most powerful graphical representations I know of to show you why uh, an average change of a degree can lead to so many changes in disruptive weather. So let's ask, what is the probability to have an extreme weather event? And this was published by Jim Henson and his colleagues. As I said, it's getting a little old now, but it's still a very powerful graphic. So let's imagine that we're going to take the average temperature in Abu Dhabi and record it every day or every hour for a long period of time. And that'll be a whole string of numbers. And then we're going to make a graph. We'll have the probability that we have a certain temperature uh, shown here. And it's going to be one of these bell curves, perhaps like Professor Bias's class when she teaches it. Uh, there's an average. And you'll recognize that these kind of bell curves are characterized by an average, which, and by the way, in Abu Dhabi, the year-round average is about 27C. But there are these rare events, aren't they? Very cold uh, and very, uh, very uh, cold and very warm events. And uh, they're supposed to be rare, because the Gaussian tells you that that's supposed to be rare. And so the question is, how much of the Earth has experienced a temperature larger than uh, these, uh, these purple bars indicate, two or three times the standard deviation? Because uh, Hansen and his colleagues recognize very quickly that a small change in the mean has a big effect on the tails. So let's see how that works out. So what Jim and his colleagues did is they made a graph of the world. And on that graph, they plotted uh, these uh, temperature standard deviations from the mean. Uh, minus, uh, the purple is minus three standard deviations. That's a very, very cold day compared to the average. And brown is a very warm day. So here we are. So uh, the, uh, the average, remember, is the century long. So here we are in 1955. And you see a lot of areas are cooler and some are warmer. Here we are in 1965, 1975. You get the picture so far? Take a deep breath. 
So here we are, this was 2011, and as you probably know, as I said before, the four of the last five years have been the warmest in recorded history. So uh, this is the characteristic of distributions. You change the mean a little bit, and the tails uh, affect you uh, greatly. Here's another interesting, this was just published from, by the Indian government uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, this is the number of heat and cold wave events as a function of time in India. And I think it's pretty obvious to you uh, that the number of extreme events is going up. And so uh, temperature is one consequence. Weather is another consequence. Here's one that you might not have thought about, which is behavior. So let's imagine that you're two young men uh, you're walking uh, in a summer day, on a, on a hot summer day on a street in Italy. And uh, one of the young men says to the other, let's go to a pub and get a cold beer. Because if we run into those other guys, we're bound to get into a brawl. Well, Mercutio and Benvolio did run into the other guys, Thibault and his gang. Uh, Romeo joins them, and uh, Thibault and Mercutio wind up dead. Uh, hence that famous line. For now these hot days is the mad blood stirring. So was Shakespeare onto something there? Is it true that on a hot day we're more likely to be violent? Well, if that were the case, for me, a day like today would be, would be very stressful. <laughs> but of course, what was, what's being asked by climate scientists is not whether it's hotter in one part of the world than another, but whether it's hotter relative to the average. And so uh, Solomon uh, Shang and his colleagues at Berkeley published this landmark paper a few years ago, which has been followed up by several others, in which they ask, what is the relationship between temperature deviation from the norm and violence? And he started off by looking at this region in the world. So here's the first graph. Here's the percent conflict risk, risk in this part of East Africa, the brown part here, as a function of temperature average, de deviation from the average. Uh, now, you'll notice that uh, there's large shady areas, and so that's because uh, events that are very different in temperature are rare, and so the shading is a way to indicate the error bar associated with this analysis. But you can see pretty clearly that by the time you get a d one degree above the normal, the uh, local violence in East Africa increased greatly. And how about the whole civil war incidents in sub-Saharan Africa, that is this purple section. And notice the scale is half the width of this one. Again, the same thing, an increase in violence with an increasing temperature. And here is uh, the uh, civil conflict in all of the global tropics down here, uh, and you see the same strong correlation. Now, Berkeley students sometimes say, and I regret that they would say this, but they would sometimes say, well, that's true for those people. But it's, it's not really true for us. The wealthy, privileged Americans don't have this problem. Uh, au contraire, here's violent personal crime in the USA, 5% uh, increase. Uh, here's rape in the USA and violent intergroup retaliation. So the answer is there's a strong correlation between increased violence relative to the average temperature of that day. Now I know some of you will say correlation is not causation. And I got that. I see a lot of heads nodding. Solomon and his colleagues get that also. But I'll tell you, the Defense Department and law enforcement agencies around the world take climate change very, very seriously. Uh, scientists are looking for uh, what might be causation. And there's preliminary, uh, published but not uh, published deeply enough yet, evidence that suggests the serotonin and dopamine levels in the brain vary uh, in ways that correlate with the uh, temperature that you're accustomed to. And a lot more data is needed, so the causation may be there. The correlation clearly is. So let's see, how about sea levels, glaciers and ice levels? That's a good one. Uh, here was a landmark paper published in 2015 which shows the mean sea level as a function of calendar year. The sea levels come from either markers for tide lines or from radar measurements from satellites. A lot of noisy data, but what was controversial about this paper is that the authors said, look, in one period of time, the oceans are rising about a millimeter a year, but as we get uh, closer to the modern area, it's rising at three millimeters a year. It's accelerating. Uh, very controversial, so controversial, a completely different team of scientists a year and a half later reanalyzed the whole thing, and sure enough, they came up with the same conclusion. The rate, present day rate, is three millimeters, and it's accelerating. 
So why is the, uh, why are the oceans rising? The primary reason is, of course, as water temperature goes up, uh, the, uh, density, the density of water changes and the water depth gets higher. So it's mainly a heating of the oceans effect. But you're asking, where's all the water runoff from the ice melting? Well, one of the reasons acceleration is occurring has to do with the fact that if you look just in Antarctica alone and ask here in this blue line, the blue line are data, these three are, are models, we don't need to look at that. The blue data show that we're up to now five millimeter contribution of increasing sea level just from melting in Antarctica. So it's not just the water expanding because it's heating, we're also adding water to the bathtub by melting glaciers uh, and so forth. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, uh, the oceans are getting warmer and their density changes and so the level of the ocean changes, but it's not uniform. And that's a tricky thing because we think of the oceans as a bathtub and if the level goes up, it goes up evenly. It doesn't because winds and water currents uh, have uh, affect this. So some water comes from deep in the ocean up to the surface. And so here's a map that shows uh, sea level change from al radar altimetry. So uh, here's the United States here, uh, Asia over here, Africa here, and you recognize that it's not uniform. That is, the water is rising faster in some parts of the world than others, an unfortunate consequence of their geography. Um, but what this means is that places like the Marshall Islands are disappearing already. I don't recall exactly what, um, what the level of Abu Dhabi is, but I'm gonna guess that if the waters rise 10, 20, 30 feet, one, two, three meters, Abu Dhabi's in trouble. We'll see more of that in a few minutes. How about glaciers? Here's the Rhone Glacier. It feeds the Rhone River in Europe, one of the most important European rivers. Uh, it's hard for you to see, perhaps, maybe I'll use this diagram. My daughter and I were hiking along this trail and took measurements along the face of this glacier right here, about this time, 2010. Uh, and in 1850, an artist drew uh, the stories from people who live in this village about the glacier having been, the front of the glacier having been right at the center of this village. So uh, in, in a relatively short period of time, the glacier has retreated. In fact, if you hike along this glacier, hike along this path, there are markers in the ground that show what year uh, the front end of the glacier was at that point, and you see it marching back. At this point, the uh, Rhone Glacier is gone in 2050 which means the Rhone River becomes a seasonal river as opposed to a continuously running one. An interesting consequence. But we have data. We have a lot of data on glaciers. This is the amount of data, the number of glaciers that have been measured, either their mass or from other measurements, or here, the variation in front. Uh, and so we have a lot of data, and the data is all very clear. The glaciers are shrinking. There's a few glaciers in some parts of the world that are growing. It is an interesting observation, and there are local reasons, weather reasons, why that might be so. But overall, around the world, glaciers are shrinking, and they're shrinking rapidly. The extent of the uh, Arctic ice, yeah, the North Pole. So this is the extent of the ice uh, in millions of square kilometers as a function of time of year, right? And so in the summertime, uh, as you can see, the ice is retreated in the wintertime, it's at its maximum. Here's the average for the past 50 years, sorry, 40 years, sorry, 30 years, I can do that. Uh, here we are at 2018, and as many of you know, we are expecting an ice-free Arctic uh, in the near future uh, for an opportunity for many capitalists to exploit the resources that are present there. How about Antarctica? I'm going to show you a series of four decadal snapshots. This is another one of these busy movies. But let's just take it apart. So this pie chart says for all of Antarctica, this fraction lost mass and this fraction gained mass. This is one part of the Arctic, uh, Antarctic Peninsula and so forth, the west and east. This is the period 79 to 89. You with me? 89 to 99. The size of these circles indicates the total amount, 99 to 2009, 2009 to 2017. The Antarctic is losing, losing ice at a phenomenally high rate. Here's another disturbing trend. This, was, this paper was just published a couple weeks ago uh, in PNAS, and it asks what is the rate at which the Antarctic sea ice changes? Not, how, not whether the ice is there or not, but the rate at which it grows and shrinks. 
each year. Look at this, how this rate is oscillating as we get forward in time. And those of you who know any mathematics at all, and certainly any engineering mathematics, will note that uh, increasing oscillations are a sign of instability. So, we're changing the Earth's atmosphere. All these things are happening. It's happening by radiative forcing. I could spend another uh, hour giving you a lecture on the biological consequences of these. I, have, I haven't done that. And so now uh, we have to ask the following question. What does the future look like? And uh, the first thing I should have done, where did I put my, uh, uh, you'll tell me uh, what time it is so that I, okay, I don't want to get you in any trouble, right? So, um, so now we've been looking at data from the past. How do we go forward in time and ask, what's the next 100 years going to look like, or next 1,000 years? This is an extremely difficult problem. Engineering scientists have been conserving momentum via equations, conserving mass via equations, and conserving energy via equations. These are equations that I love. They're, they're my people's equations, right? And we use them all the time. You use them all the time, too. Every time you get into a modern car and every time you fly in a modern aircraft, these aircraft have been designed on a computer. They were designed on a computer using these equations. And a, and a methodology in which the space around the car and the airplane is divided into little pieces. And inside each piece, these equations are applied. So it works really well, engineering design, for macroscopic objects. It surely ought to work uh, for the world. So now you imagine taking the planet, and you have uh, uh, surface elements, pixels, and you have volume elements above, voxels, and now you have to apply those equations to each of those elements. And it's hard. And it's hard because what's going on in every one of those elements is a whole host of physics which are phenomenologically observed and not necessarily quantified. The relationship between aerosols and how much sunlight gets to the surface of the planet. Uh, the relationship between uh, the kind of soil and the kinds of forests we have and the amount of light that's reflected. These are all difficult problems, and this is probably one of the most difficult intellectual problems uh, of our generation, which is to encompass all this kind of chemistry and physics into the mathematics necessary to do this. So let's suppose you do it. You sit down, you write these equations, you figure it out. How do you test them? It's not like we have a time machine going forward. Ah, but we do have a time machine going backward. We have all the data historically. So what we can do is say, how do those models work at predicting the data that has ha been recorded for the past 100 years? So here you have uh, these yellow lines represent a whole bunch of different computer simulations by different groups around the world. Uh, and the red line is the average of those simulations, and the black line is the data. And it looks like we're doing a pretty good job. But once you can go back in time, you can also go back in time with these equations and say, what effects gave rise to those temperature changes? And uh, so I have a nice little video for you. Let's see if I can get it launched here. So again, here's temperature compared to the average as a function of time. Here's the observed data. Now let's see if my little uh, video works. It should. Please. It will next. Yeah, I tested this before, so let me just uh, exit. Ah, OK. So here is uh, orbital changes. That is, the Earth's orbit around the sun changes. That's the effect on temperature. The solar output changes. Solar, uh, that's that effect. And here is uh, uh, um, volcanic activity. You see it has big effects when it puts dust in the atmosphere. So let's add all those up. These are uh, what we might call uh, natural factors. Here's the data. Here's natural factors. Let's take some unnatural factors, the fact that we're uh, using land differently for growing crops mainly. Uh, here's ozone. Ozone, we contributed to the atmosphere, and that has a big effect. Uh, here's aerosols. Aerosols, of course, cool the planet. Uh, and we'll come to geoengineering later. Here's greenhouse gases. Again, I'm sorry for the word greenhouse. 
Uh, and so those are the human-induced factors. So now we can add them all up. So here's uh, the sum of the human factors. Uh, and there's the observed data. And now let's add everything together, all factors. So there you see the match between computation and data over time. I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job. But a lot more work needs to be done on this. And the brightest of the minds of our century should be working on this problem. But now we can look forward to the future. Let's go to 2044. Uh, and let's assume that we do manage to keep the planet at 2 degrees C. By the way, we're nowhere close to that. But let's just imagine that we might do that. So one of the things I like about this graph is it reminds us that the warming occurs most rapidly uh, in the Arctic. And the reason is because right now the Arctic is covered with snow and ice. It reflects a lot of sunlight. And the minute that starts to melt, more sunlight is absorbed. It heats up faster. And uh, these are the coldest nighttime temperatures, which is another reminder that you tend not to experience uh, global warming uh, in the daytime temperatures, because we're active and busy. Actually, you experience it more in the nighttime. Uh, so you see, on average, you know, uh, this part of the world is only at 2 or 3 degrees C. But you see certain parts of the world have um, a very uh, dramatic effect. So I could, I could go on for an hour showing you various predictions for the future. They're not going to make you feel any better. So let's just leave it at this and say that the future has many complications associated with it. Uh, we have temperatures rising, sea levels rising, temperatures warming, glaciers retracting, ice declining, extreme weather increasing. Uh, the lakes and oceans are stressed. I didn't talk about that. Uh, CO2 is warming, and it's due to you and I, and it's established. And mathematical models connect us to what our consequences are for the future. And all these topics require really systematic studies. But the Earth has seen this before. It's hard to run an experiment, even on a computer, predicting the future. But you can go back in time and ask, how has the Earth experienced wild fluctuations uh, in the CO2 content. So here's uh, the deep ocean temperature as measured by an isotope measurement. Again, the reasons for that are a little bit wonky, and I'll avoid them. But what you see here is here's the present day, and we're going back in time 60 million years. By the way, how do you get these data? You go down to the bottom of the ocean, you pull up a core of mud, and in that mud are shells, and in those shells are uh, chemicals, and in those chemicals are isotopes, and you measure those isotopes, and from that you get the temperature at which the shell was formed. Beautiful, beautiful science. Uh, let's look along here. Oops, what's this? That's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. It happened about 55 million years ago. It's a very interesting and uh, poignant event for us to study. So why is that? Well, so what we do is we analyze these seashells, and we look now at uh, the isotopes of carbon and oxygen. And when we do that, uh, we see that right about this time, there was a huge and massive amount of either CO2 or methane dumped into the atmosphere. Uh, by the way, how, can I, how come I can't tell between CO2 and methane? When we release methane into the atmosphere, it's a strong uh, radiative force in gas, but it reacts uh, to form CO2 in about 20 years. So on geological timescales, you can't really tell the difference between CO2 and methane. So there it is, a large peak. Uh, and that's about 4,000 gigatons of carbon introduced into the atmosphere. Right now, you and I are at a one-fourth of that value from our combustion activities. Uh, we can measure the temperature. Oh, that was that peak, and this is blown up. And you see the width of that peak is on the order of 100,000 years. Uh, and the height of that peak is about 6 degrees C, or thereabouts. Uh, if we look at the um, um, number of shells that are in that mud sample, when the CO2 concentration gets high, the water is so acidic, shells don't form. And so there's no shelled animals in that window of time. And you can see that by this dip right here. And the good news is that in 100,000 years, the shells were back. And in a couple hundred thousand years, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and the temperature will return to its previous value. That's part of this geological cycle that's going on. So the PETM shows us what the world can do and how the world responds. Let's take a look at a map of the world. Now, uh, 
Cautionary note, 55 million years ago, the continents weren't in the same place they are now because they drift around, you know, continental drift. But the point of this slide is to remind you that uh, there are parts of the world that are not habitable by humans. This is the average day-night temperature. Okay? This is not the peak of the day. It's a lot hotter during the day. Yeah? And, uh, and notice, by the way, that uh, what uh, all the ice having melted on the surface of the planet, look at what it does to various parts of the world. So the Amazon basin, uh, look at what's happened to Asia, uh, let alone this part of the world. And of course, the entire eastern seaboard is underwater and some of the western seaboard. Uh, let's see, uh, just to remind you that uh, your average temperature now is 27. So uh, there are portions of Australia and the North Pole in which uh, the average temperatures are livable, but uh, large portions of the Earth are not livable. So compared to the PETM, how fast are we changing the atmosphere? So this was uh, an event that took place over about 4,000 years. So these are the data, and these are mathematical models to the data, and it tells you that the carbon came into the atmosphere over about 4,000 years. What is it due to? Unknown. A grand puzzle. People speculate a meteor impact. Others suggest volcanic activity that ignited peats in the northern hemisphere. Peats are this part of the soil that looks like, uh, looks like dirt, but actually contains a lot of burnable carbon. It's actually not clear. But just to remind you that we are putting 10 billion metric tons of carbon per year into the atmosphere, and the PETM was on the order of 0.6 to 1. So we are introducing carbon to the atmosphere at a rate 10 times faster uh, than what the PETM did. OK, the atmosphere is changing. The change is due to combustion. Climate is changing. Radiative forcing connects these two each other. The Earth has seen this before. In 200,000 years or so, we return to normal. All is good. Not quite. Uh, so I'm just going to close. Do I, is it time for me to close? Yeah, OK. I've already gone, uh, pressed your patience too far. Um, what are we going to do? So there's a suite of activities that many of us in climate science want our policymakers, want the public uh, to engage in. So for example, energy efficient infrastructure is the easiest and most straightforward way to decrease our energy consumption and lower the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, Use of uh, cleaner fuels, so replacing coal with natural gas, uh, it turns out to be of great benefit to introducing CO2 into the atmosphere. Because if you look at the amount of CO2 put into the atmosphere per kilowatt of power produced, um, methane is a much better fuel than, uh, than, than coal. Uh, a surprisingly powerful effect is the role of forests. And uh, you may have heard people say, and you may have laughed like man, many of us did, oh, plant a tree and everything will get better. That sounds like an extremely foolish notion. After all, trees eventually decay and become CO2. But the further science has gone along, and especially in the past five years, it's now widely recognized that planting trees is a really good idea. And it could be one of the most significant ways to decrease carbon in the atmosphere as it exists now. Um, nuclear power, well, I, you know, that's a, that's a toxic word uh, in our modern environment. Some environmentalists uh, still maintain that nuclear power is necessary to decrease the carbon footprint. Of course, you know about wind and solar. Carbon capture and sequestration is the subject of my researches, my group's research. I'm very heavily involved in this uh, research where you uh, say to the community, you've invested $4 billion into a coal-fired power plant. Uh, it may be very naive for me to think you can just shut it off and replace it with solar and wind. Why not add to that coal-fired power plant a device which takes the CO2 out of the exhaust gas and pumps it underground and pumps it into those places that we've already taken oil and gas out of. So carbon capture and sequestration is still a primary part of the International Panel for Climate Change's suggested solutions. Um, it, it is perhaps foolish to think that all of us, if we all sat down together and used less electricity, we'd be saving the planet. That's, that's a little bit naive. But it is important to recognize that as consumers, uh, we do have an effect on society. And nothing, and this is going to sound silly, but it weighs on me a great deal that I flew here to give this talk. Right? As many of you know, uh, um, 
Flying in an airplane is one of the worst things you can do to the environment. Uh, I, I passivate my guilt by buying, buying carbon offsets, uh, which, is a, which is a way of sending money to an agency which plants trees uh, at a, in proportion to the amount of carbon you use. Uh, it's a way to assuage guilt. It's not clear how effective it is. Uh, a direct air capture is our last resort, my friends. Uh, when the water is lapping up around our ankles here on the campus, uh, and we need to get rid of the CO2 out of the atmosphere, we may in fact engineer systems that can take CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. It's also an area in which my colleagues and I are very actively involved in our research. And if you want to know a hard problem, take uh, 10, 10 gigatons of carbon out of the air when the concentration is 413 parts per million. That is a huge engineering problem. And as I mentioned earlier today in, in a colloquium to my colleagues, the scale of this project is larger than any other engineering project ever engaged in by humanity. So this is a, this is a tough one. Well, I want to uh, thank Professor Bias in particular for this opportunity. Uh, thank uh, Abu Dhabi and NYU Abu Dhabi in particular for this chance to be here uh, with you. And I think I'm allowed to answer some questions now if I'm understanding. So thank you very much and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.